Hello everyone, right then, let me just get the chat set up so I can have that popped out and separate. And minimize this. Let's see. Hello everyone. Hello. So, today of course, It is all about naval diplomacy, which I've sort of put out, I was going to do just one big introduction for and then did an extended one as well. So now two introductions. So hello, Bijon. Hello, Richard Hughes. Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, John Shee. Hello, Potter. Hello, King's Rook. <laughs> Hi, Richard Hughes. I've said hi to you already twice. Hello, Albert. Hello, Jay. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Neil. Hi, Martin. Hi, Carl. Carl Gasman. Wasn't Kirov reporting the um, message that you got in Red Alert 2 when you um, selected those airships that the Soviets had, which were rather cool airships, but terrible for any doing anything really decent in them? Afternoon, Blue Shirt Buddha. Hello, Stafford. Hello, this is Francis Fult. Hello, Jay Richardson. Hello, Osprey. Hello, Sean Mack. Hello, Brock. Hello, Oliver Pike. Hello, Jeffrey. Hi, Michael Rose. Hello, everyone. Right. I know I've got all sorts of family and people listening, so thank you. Thank you, especially to Anne and Louise for listening. And Mum and Karen. And I keep putting you all in different order. So, thank you. Um, uh, me and Drak and Fennel's plans for world dominations are how uh, uh, Drak's plans for domination, world domination are over. Um, someone on our Discord advertised that there was a um, very interesting little BB coil gun for $1,100, which. A little bit steep for me to pay, but I think um, Drac was interested enough that it, we were looking into shipping it and seeing if you get it in the UK. Unfortunately, you can't get it shipped over to the UK. It's cruelty, cruelty. No coil gun BBs, uh, BBs for us. And my plans for adapting the BBs to little edibles and seeing what I could do with them are completely, of course, nonsensical. <clears throat> Thanks, Brock. Take care. <coughs> what do I think naval diplomacy... <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. What do I think naval diplomacy in space will look like? Um, probably much as diplomacy does today. I honestly think... That's the one thing I used to like about um, Star Trek, was that there was often quite a lot of diplomacy going on. I was kind of interested that the diplomacy itself then took place view screen to view screen from Captain's Bridge to Captain... Uh, from sort of the bridge to the... Bri uh, to the um, bridge to bridge. But, you know, I can understand that happening. I have a feeling it'll be interesting unless you have a universal translator which works. Thank you. Hello, turning three four three. You're early. Yes, you are. Hi, Carl. HMS Argus, Mistress of the Caribbean. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, that was me. I am the administrator. Well, you have started off very interesting. And a very worried Jamie, honestly, on our little um, chat group, which we organized the the bilge pumps on. I, I, I think Jamie's slightly worried about quite how well armed both of us are. In certain respects, 
Morning, Austin. Hello, Eric. Hi, Paul. And hello, Daniel World War Two. Have I read The Expanse? Um, a while back I did. I haven't actually watched it yet. I've read some of the stuff about it. Is France fault? Yes. But... I have a feeling diplomacy is going to be interesting. Diplomacy is going to be interesting. And I really do like out of it the... Um, mm. The Space Diplomacy, my favourite book, looking forward to have it, is, um, go to my Kindle, I'll quickly get it out. No, no. I can tell I've been writing a lot of history lately. DJ Holmes, um, the Empire Rising series. That has all sorts of space diplomacy in it. It really, really is quite cool. Sam Thompson, when I showed my mum the BCG, she said, why so many heads? What, you don't need 90 seats of ease and 90 showers. I looked at her and said, yeah. Basically, in the nicest way, you do need certain facilities. And if you want to be really nice, you do need those facilities a lot. <sighs> Plus, raw marines aren't basically allowed back on ship until after they've had a shower when they've been ashore. It's a standard operating practice. You came ashore. Go to the heads now. Austin Ham. How important is the size of the vessel you bring to port in naval diplomacy? And as a joke, how would that apply to space diplomacy? Well, okay. Now, here's the interesting thing. You can get away with a river class patrol vessel, uh, ocean offshore patrol vessel, or a sloop. In an area, as long as it's acting as a sort of outrider to a bigger vessel. We're talking these days, Type 31 size. In prior to World War II, we'd be talking town class cruiser size. Mainly, we'd be talking cruiser level. And honestly, I have a feeling cruiser level is what you'd be talking about. The ship has got to be adequate enough that it presents not so much of a threat... That it could wipe out your forces single-handedly. That's probably going to be a little bit too threatening. Well, at least it can't look like it can do. It might be able to, but it can't look like it can do. But also, it must be enough of a threat that you have to respect it. And you're going to respect its its commander and it's sort of the importance of it. And preferably have enough of a force internally that it can do the stuff it needs to do. So, again... Pretty much when I'm talking about them and I'm envis envisaging a Earth sort of cruiser sort of thing, I'm thinking of the George S. Hammond from Stargate sort of sized vessel. A vessel which has a lot of hitting power itself. But is mainly about the fact that it can yeah, but is mainly sort of it's a it's a moving thing. It's got fighters, it's got it's a good all round vessel that can do pretty much everything. Bishop Bishop Butter, Dux O'Clock, is the size of government always correlated to the importance of diplomacy? Not necessarily. Okay, there's a good point, and Drac has made this several times on um bilge pumps, but Sorry, just removing the ice pack from my leg. Uh, but it's a, a well-known point, and it's a point I've also made. You sometimes, in certain situations, you actually send in the smallest possible vessel you can 
to try and go. We are so confident of our power here. We don't need to send in something big. We can send in something small. And that's especially what you might use when you're coming between two warring powers and you want to calm them down. Because if you send in a very big, powerful vessel, you might overrule them. But what you also need to do is you need to have that big, powerful vessel, probably not far away, so the small vessel's got support. So the big, powerful vessel will be in the region. The small vessel will be the one that goes in, sort of scenario. But usually you try and, you know, regular visits are what matters. It almost matter more than the size of the vessel that something turns up regularly. Or some... Uh, I think that answers both Austin's and Blue Shirt's questions. Vision. My thinking on the view screen, the view screen communication is to have a little a screen or a little room off the CIC to conduct such communication with some security. Yes, that makes far more sense than having a screen which can see your entire command and control center, which is your bridges. King Crook. I like how in track that everyone has a head in their quarters aboard ship. Yes, that is quite nice. And honestly, for space travel, especially if you're going to be out there for a long time. This is something you have to think about. When you're talking about ships going off for year for years on on Earth, you had to be able to ensure regular shore leave and these sort of things to try and maintain crew crew morale. If you're talking about long distance in space, depending on the power supply and energy you're using and all, uh, your method of travel, you're going to probably have a long time up there. In which case, you're going to have to start thinking about crew accommodations. You know, you're going to have to think, probably it's going to be a maximum of two to a room with their own heads, their own facilities in that room. And actually, it might be better to have two in a room because then if you start suffering any issues of being in space, you've got someone else there with you. Osprey Train, while we are settling in, I must ask, have you heard of the Children of Dead Earth? It's an attempt to approximate what space combat will look like. Um, I've heard of it, but I haven't actually do done more than heard of it. You're about the third person, Osprey, who's mentioned it to me in about four months, and I honestly haven't done more than go, that's nice, book. <laughs> so now a book is in and all happy, and the publishers are now sorting things through, and who knows what's going to happen with them, they're lovely. They're, it, the book's all been accepted, but it's just publisher stuff, it's fun. Um, we'll see what happens, and I'll start looking at things. Jennifer, funnily enough, there are some famous admirals named the Empire Raising series of books, Dr. Luck. Yes, there are. In fact, Admiral Somerville is the um, leader of it, so as I regularly tell Jamie, he should be the one proposing it, not me, but it's me. It is me. Mm-hmm. SM Pi, how does evacuation operations like those conducted by the Indian Navy in Yemen, evacuation of both Indians and foreign nationals, affect presence and diplomacy? They are a great example of what you can do if you have presence and diplomacy. They build up favours with those countries you evacuate. This, again, was something the Royal Navy used to do around the world for the smaller nations. It used to be a case of, oh, did ambassador go, oh, don't worry, we have a ship present in a region. You have some nationals who are in trouble, we'll pick them up for you. Don't worry, no need for you to send your warships or to worry about it, because it's weeks away and you won't get there in time. Don't worry, we have a ship in the region. Telegram, telegram, the Royal Navy captain would turn up and go, I'm taking these people as well, as the Brits. Locals might go, well, you know, they're not your people, I'm taking them. Interesting enough, a lot of stuff like that had happened in Shanghai and various other places on the Chinese coast during the Sino-Japanese War, where the Royal Navy would be there and go, you're not going to bomb us. If you bomb us, that's a war, and we are going to start removing people. And they would remove not just the foreign nationals, i.e. the British, etc. there, they would remove some of the Chinese as well. If they wanted to go, they would get aboard their ship and they'd take them away. And... Um, 
you could try and stop us. Vision. I actually find a tie class tanker impressive for a port visit. Besides, most people can't tell a tanker from a battleship. No, I'm sorry, it just doesn't work. I love the tie class. I am a very big fan of the tie class, but they are not a port visit material. They're just not, okay? They really aren't. We might dream of such a day, but that's a long, long way away. It really is. A long, long way away. Right then. Hello, Thomas. This runs for all. Do you know how monstrous a Galaxy class ship is? Really isn't, actually. That's the interesting thing. I've looked at a lot of studies and a lot of the sort of the things which show up online which compare ship sizes. Galaxy class isn't that massive compared to some of them. Um Honestly, if you want really big, you're talking about No. There are a fair number of big ones. I'm talking uh, I'm I'd be thinking more about Stargate Atlantis. That's massive. That's beautiful though. I like Stargate Atlantis. I I think Atlantis is a beautiful play, a beautiful thing. A beautiful, beautiful ship. And just a reminder, bilge pumps. Very cool. Link down below. Um, uh, showers in a nuclear biological chemical contaminated environment, almost all disaster starters is a must. Yes. And the more showers you can have, and water generation for those showers. Make sure they don't run out of hot water that quickly. Oh, Sam. So something like a Venator class Star Destroyer from Star Wars is actually a decent ship for diplomacy in space. An Imperial class SD, lesser. That's the interesting thing. The Imperial class Star Destroyer is great for intimidating people. But I would have actually preferred the Venator class. And I read and I was watching an interesting one, I think it was on Generation Tech, basically saying why the Republican, the Rebels, didn't go and get a load of Venators out of where they were basically being scrapped and build them up and use them. And the main point was, well, their fighters will self-deploy anyway, so they don't need a carrier capability as the Venator really is. And I was sitting there thinking, well, actually, a Venator is one of the easiest designs to surely upgrade. Surely, with all the space and that hangar space, you can easily slot in extra shield generators if you don't need as much fighter-carrying space. And then that provides a facility for you to rapidly rearm your fighters on the move. And instead of your fighter base being a planet, your fighter base is a Venator class or a couple of Venator class or you know, even three or four Venator class, which are moving around and able to move. So instead of the Imperial forces being able to track you down and go, they are here, destroy them on this planet. Well, in the case of their Imperial Star Destroyers have entered the system. Bye-bye! Gone. You know, it would have made sense to me, but, you know, that's just me. I'm just an English historian. Um, let's see. Vision. Um, Kingsrook Federation. Starships look like a Marriott thanks to Almiral Elmo Zumwalt's efforts at retaining Starfleet personnel. Probably. Um, <clears throat> I think the gain is high. I'm hearing cracking on more emphasized statements. Right then. So. Has the gain been turned down enough? Is that turning the gain down or is it turning it up? You have to tell me. Um, Thomas Rutter, so who decides which place to get diplomatic presence mission? Uh, Foreign Commons, does Admiralty then decide which ships go? Basically, it's a combined operation between the two. The two usually work out together what needs to be there. Which is your strategically more important area? Okay, they'll tend to have the bigger presence. And then there'll be a local commander who'll be sending things around. Hmm. 
And then here's a publisher to our stuff, 12 to 6 months. It shouldn't be that long, seeing as they've put it out as being around about December. Um, sometimes it moves, but they have put it around about December. Angus Hassan, uh, Dog's Clock. Is there a Sea Madness like the supposed Space Madness? Unfortunately, there is a bit of one. Um, there have been cases of people jumping off ships, etc., into the ocean because they get so fed up with it. But it's far rarer. Um, you can get out and smell fresh air, which you can't do. And in a submarine, there is a reason they have as many watches and as many locks on the systems which open the doors as they do on the hatches. Um, this one's wrong. The way I conduct space war is computer predicted uh, geometric pattern volume of fire, taking into account ship direction speed. There's only so much a ship can uh, can move to avoid damage. In theory, Jeff uh, C. A. J. Jerry writes some good, great space war for better books, and even wrote a good, no good notification article on the topic. Hmm, interesting, nonfiction article on topic. Yeah, Gordon Collins. I'm a bit late due to playing Halo 3. Came into the stream as you're discussing sci-fi ships. Yes, well, the moment you start discussing, discussing naval diplomacy, actually, it's quite easy to get onto the subject of space warfare and space diplomacy because there's going to be a lot of similarities to it, especially to the more, this, uh, the more 1920s, 1930s period because what you're going to be dealing with is a scenario where your ships are going to be a long way from anyone who can help them and anyone who can tell them what do you want them to do. Okay. Venosemi, with New Zealand and their cruisers in the 40s and 50s, is this sort of thing they would do with having warships in the Pacific to pull people out and make visits? Pretty much. That was what they were there for. Hi, King George V. Hi, Jeff Beeler. Um, yeah. Uh, show me. <laughs> oh, yes, all those. Sal Thompson. Federation of small ships compared to other powers, just in Trek. Destiny is my favorite Stargate ship. Love the lower main battery. That is quite cool, but I've always wondered with that system why they... It's going to sound strange. They have the ability to generate their own things, and they've gone for this system of a lower main battery and all these others. I was always not su surprised they didn't have an upper system. And why are they storing their ships? If you've got something going around space, going far away from home, why in the name of all things holy do you have your aircraft, on, your deployable aircraft, on the outside of your ship? Why? Just seems so silly. You put them on a, in a hangar inside the ship where they'd be protected, and you'd have things like a dome, etc. Which you'd, if it's supposed to go in the sun anyway. Why isn't there a dome which goes over the part of the greenhouse area? Why? Why did the biodome not properly protect it? Again, you would expect a very advanced race to think of these things. And sitting there going, your entire plots are written around the idea of these people being. Very, very moronically stupid on occasion. You sort of go, they're supposed to be a super advanced race, and I know you play on their arrogance a bit, but this was pre-Ascension, when obviously they weren't as arrogant, hopefully not as arrogant as they became. Which, yeah. Um, Strub, does the rank of the captain matter more than the size of Ursel? It does have a bearing, but you have to be quite they have to be appropriate to the size of the vessel. You don't want an admiral wandering around in a sloop. Um, well, if he is, it's called his yacht. He's not commanding it. It's his yacht. Uh, Paul Johnson, when did George Lucas think properly about Star Wars younglings? Uh, who knows? SM Pike, Dutch Clark, uh, shouldn't Navy start planning for a squadron of diplomacy ships, which would be their light ships, but with a fancy 
paint job and staterooms. Can you use deployments on foreign services? Um, this is the thing. This is the point I was making about the Type 31s. And why I really like them. Why whenever people start shooting, they go, we need more warships. We don't need Type 31s. They're not being built as a bit as more powerful as the Type 26. Da, 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 da. Well, yeah, they're not. So what? That's not their job. Their job in wartime is to be the second row and in peacetime to be the front row. That's the thing. In war, in peacetime, Type 26 and Type 45 are the second row. In wartime, they're the front row. That's what you're building. You're building the swap mount. In wartime, Type 31, River Class, they're your second row. They're your back. But in peacetime, they're your front row. They're the ones you can have furthest out, deployed around the world, doing all the stuff around the world. That's their point. The same things which make them excellent at being around the world deployed on a peacetime role makes them excellent as second row in wartime. The same things which make Type 26s to Type 45s excellent warships, front row in wartime, mean they often have less space and a lot more sensitive equipment on them that you don't really want to go into uh, harbours of people who are suspect makes them far more useful as second row ships in peacetime and first row ships in wartime. It's the same scenario. It just plays back, and you need the peacetime role. Very salty. My ears thank you. That's good. I thank you as well, because I'm trying to get it to work itself out. Unfortunately, I worked out what happened is the game button got knocked. When I was sorting out other things, and I fixed one problem and created another problem for myself. See, my late was watching an air conditioning commercial. Going to be 110 today. Stephen, I wouldn't be watching the commercial. I'd be almost tempting to try and buy one at that point. SM Pi, the Daniel class runways seem like a smart space loop approach in DS9. Um, runabouts, yeah, they do. The Daniel class runabouts do seem like a start space loop approach. And then if you consider it, they then have above them the Defiant class light cruiser wandering around going, Hello? Have you been nasty to my little friend? Have you? Have you? A little bit of space for it. So it, it makes sense. And there's far more space back on the um, space station for diplomacy, if they need it. King, recording the speed of space Manager. Sounds like getting a good night's sleep would help a lot with that. Eh, that's the trouble. Usually you don't get it. Uh, get a good night's sleep on those circumstances. Hi, Adam Crow. See what? Gonna need Elon to build Space Dreadnought. Mmm, we can tell. I knew IKB4472. Could the hatch on the sub even be opened against the water pressure? You'd be surprised what happened in some of the early subs. This first of all, I remember seeing a thing about a French ship in, I think, Portsmouth, and it was mocked heavily because it was right. It was a right state, rust everywhere. It wasn't a good look at all, and that was from Allies. Yeah, and you should hear what's said sometimes about the Americans who show up these days. In some of the Far East places, um, they roll into Japan, they roll into Australia, and they look like, mm. again, the British ships a few years ago were not much better. British ships have started looking fairly good recently. A, we've changed the painting regime. B, we've changed the paint. So, Thompson, Dr. Clark, I agree with both points on Destiny. Never said she was perfect. I know. King's Rook, the Asians are nothing if not arrogant and short eyed. Again, one of the other things I'm surprised if for a native state who's planning all this thing, why not some drone fighters to protect her? That'd be so useful when she's taking on the drones as well and all the other scenarios she ends up in. Oliver Pike, I think that friendship was just before Westland 19. Probably. Uh, sure, Mac. Tonight's on Donager from Expanse for Presence. Ooh. Thoughts on Donager from Expanse for Presence? Uh. It can work. It can work. Osprey 28. For space combat, closing speeds are going to be insane. Missile spam, nuke spam, very heavily armored ships, tons of drones, rapid fire guns with reloads, measures in milliseconds, and omni ships. Hmm. Interesting ideas. But good work. The new, not, no, not any chance of death, but it's <laughs> something you would like to obtain. It's worth tackling anyone trying. Hmm. Come on, guys, 
Evil Knight. Is your ship new or old? Uh, it must be Mimitar. Yes, in Rust we trust. Oh. Given New Zealand's location, who would be the primary target for the naval diplomacy? I presume not Australia, and I've heard a lot about Indonesia. Is naval diplomacy why they retained the royalists to the 60s? Pretty much. Um, naval diplomacy and also being able to contribute something. Naval diplomacy is not just about the presence mission. It's what you're able to be able to contribute from a distance. Okay. So basically, having the Royalist was something fairly useful into the 60s for something as a capability that New Zealand could offer as a capability to allies. Oh, we still retain this ship. If you need us to come help, we can come help with something pretty powerful. So it's still a form of naval diplomacy. You've got to as I was saying when I'm talking about this, and especially in this one, when we're looking at this particular page, what is naval diplomacy, which is a rather appropriate area to ask as a question, your definition is far more than just your presence forward. It's what you're doing all around the world. Having the Royalist is a big statement for a country like New Zealand, which is one of the reasons why I think their running down, especially of their Navy, has been a rather short-sighted affair, because whilst I can understand the lo lo logic from the thought and the thinking and the thought process, the thing is, the Navy was a very discreet thing they could offer allies. Oh, we can turn up with this capability, we can turn up with these systems, and we can help you out if you get into trouble, so be our friend. And New Zealand doesn't have the mass to be their own force, really, so basically their protection is depending upon others, and that's why it's helpful. Mm. See, so Mike, mainly early, maybe early trireme ram for space warships. Ooh, that could be fun, but I'm not sure I'd want to ram my ship into someone else. Um, hi, Kevin. Hi, Golden Eagle. Now, an interesting thing is, before Clone Wars, the Old Republic used effectively fighter frigates, corvettes as their diplomatic vessels. Yes, and they worked quite well. I would call them more sort of equivalently sloops, really, but you know. John Emmett. Corellian corvettes for diplomatic duties. They worked. This was a really interesting slide for me to look at, the direct communication, because the interesting thing are the nations which get visits from all three, and you look at where they are. You have the Philippines. You have Malaysia, Thailand, um, South Africa, Chile. All receive visits from all three, sort of thing. Rather interesting point. Defined is no cruiser. It's an escort ship. The first generation doesn't build warships. Um, I would. That's why I'd call it, sort of classify it really as a sort of light cruiser role. As I've said it's a light cruiser. Um, in it's sort of that's the role it's functioning as. In I wouldn't really call it a full blown cruiser, but I'd say it functions as a light cruiser quite uh, quite often. Um, Undaunted Fudd. Osprey. That is why I like the Lost Fleet books by Jack Camel. The writer was a former naval officer, and he gets the physics right as in, as in accurately lacking taking physics into account. That's always good. King's Room. Ooh, gossip. Serious question. How is the RCN viewed naval diplomacy-wise? Well, you see, here's the thing. You've got the DeWolf class coming in, which are actually fairly good from a sort of presence, local presence, naval diplomacy rise. And I wouldn't be surprised if they start making lots of visits to Iceland, Greenland, and Alaska. Um, but you also have some issues in that the second row and the enforcement level is pretty light. What And for the enforcement level, especially the higher level, 
you're depending upon allies for that. So you need to start working with allies in, in that case. That's what you need to be offering. If you're going to depend on allies for your enforcement level of your naval diplomacy mission, you need to be very good, a very, very good allies with someone big. Emmon, hello. Do you think the fleet's on support ship is going to be cancelled? I hope not. I really, really hope not. I I have a fear it might be delayed. I have a fear there's lots of silly stuff being talked about, but I hope it won't be cancelled. Yeah, Kevin Tanger, is it Mysteries of the Deep tonight? Can't remember what day it is. Yes, it is tonight. It's um eight thirty. I leave, finish it tonight at eight thirty. New RSS, hello. Um, this isn't really a place we can discuss it. I can give you a fulsome answer in my Discord at King's Rock, Rick. Hmm, please do. Line high S3. Is the reason American ships look so rusty is to do a little downtime? Yes, it is, pretty much. Um, what's interesting is the scenario the US Navy's ended up since getting rid of the Olive of Hazard Perry class. The idea was based on the Cold War, certainly post-Cold War era of, well, hang on, we don't need these ships to fight a war anymore because we don't need the mass numbers because we're not going to be fighting these sort of wars because we've got no superpower threats, so we can get rid of them. The real advantage of the OHPs wasn't their war fighting capability. It was the fact that they freed up the Arley Burks to concentrate on the war fighting capability and the other ships, that sort of thing. So by taking on a lot of the lower level missions. And they were quite cheap and easy to maintain. Come on, Gazbo. Type 31 has a crew of about 100, so no, it doesn't need a twice the number of crew of the Type 26. And it doesn't cost type uh, twice the Type 26 number. I'm not sure where you're reading those statistics from, but I've looked at them, and the real... I've done quite a lot of digging on this. And yes, the Type 31s aren't going to be cheap. They're still going to be about probably 350 to 400 mil per unit. But the Type 26s are going to be a lot more than that. Hmm. Vision. Earthlight is a good novel by Arthur C. Clarke. The only book of this, I think, was space, is from Space Conduct. The novel free sh in the novel, free ships versus a surface battery on the moon. Hmm, interesting. This is front front. Space combat, I think, would measure distance in seconds, not distance for practical reasons. Possibly. Strub, is a single is a single ship or a squadron a better for naval diplomacy? A single ship is the best. Is usually better for naval diplomacy. Um, and if the enemy turns up with a squadron in your area. If you can re respond with a single very impressive looking ship from your second row naval diplomacy action, ex that's usually good. <laughs> Sir Thompson, Dr. Clark. My main issue with the Independence Class LCS is that I saw too many of them blown up in the Gundam series back in the 90s and 80s. Uh, 90s and noughties. Hmm. I can understand that. Jenov, uh, undaunted. That, that I agree. The Lost Fleet series is very believable for that reason. Excellent stuff. Hmm. Got any gold? That's fine. Do you think the Red Chinese might try to Anschluss Singapore at some point over the next uh, half century? I doubt it. They might dream of it, but I doubt they do it. And I, doubt, I don't think Singapore would want to join them. But I have a feeling that Singapore is going to be needing to be very much on its toes. And it might well like if the British do end up going some uh, something forward base in the area, the British to forward base in that region, just to give them a bit more protection, as in another nation interested in their safety and security. How much is the British diplomatic course trained to work with the RN and when does training start? Well, they used to be trained a lot to work with the RN. They used to do a lot of work together, but I don't think they're really trained these days to work with the RN, and I think they will need to be brought back. Sam Thompson. Swear that the designer watched those shows as well. Hmm. Thomas Ronald. All three visiting alternative uh, routes to Suez Canal and Panama Canal? Yeah, yeah. How? Wow. Could well be looking at those areas. Could well, just in case. 
Well, the Zvart was rather slow FDL-wise. Uh, so more like a coastal battleship. Before the cloaking device, that is. Mm. When you have the cloaking device, that does make it quite cool. And it doesn't. you don't need to necessarily be fast to be a cruiser in terms of the diplomatic mission. You need to be fast to be a cruiser in terms of the economic warfare mission. Which is a different duty. Part of it, but different. Just be like, define is an enterprise class stripped of capabilities down to the weapons. Hmm. Probably. I better assume me. Was Argentina going for naval diplomacy focus with their cruisers in the 30s and 50s, or were they building up forces against Brazil and Chile? It's a mixture of the two. Honestly, it really is a mixture of the two. One, they're thinking about economic warfare capabilities. Two, they're thinking about their particular particular threats. And three, they're thinking, well, with this, we can sail around the world and show how powerful we are. So it's a sort of naval diplomacy. More a power than a presence mission. Don Ingham, that's fine. If so, what are the implications if there's an arch list with Singapore? If China got control of Singapore, that's a big problem, mostly actually for um, India and Australia. But also quite heavily an issue for America and sort of the West. Uh, for India and Australia, uh, that's in China securing the gateway to the Indian Ocean. And being able to block off Southeast Asia, uh, block off Australia and Southeast Asia, and have a very strong logistics base there. But I don't think it's going to. The Singaporeans are very, very independent. In the nicest way, I don't think there's going to be Anschluss with Taiwan, and I don't think there's going to be Anschluss with Singapore. This transfer. I was pointing out that officially it's not a warship, though as Cisco said, it was very much a warship. Kira, I thought the Federation don't believe in warships. Cisco, officially, she's not, but... Well, yes, we are talking about an organization which officially doesn't believe in its own espionage network, which is called um, Section 31, but they get into a lot of stuff, the Section 31 does. So you want, New Zealand is the, on the top bit of the Lost Continent, a possible underwater city of the future. Hmm? Jeff Wheeler, roll of aircraft on ships in naval diplomacy? Well, they're quite useful for giving you and maximising your presence. And if you consider the case of the ambassadors in Sierra Leone used for negotiations and all those things, they're very useful for collecting people and bringing them back and dropping them off in places. And it's a useful, discreet asset. And also for maximising presence, you can make a squad of marines seem like an entire army by going and visiting different villages very quickly in the same day. However, there is a problem. They're not, they are, can make it seem like an army, but they are not an army. And this is the point. It can seem like an army, but it's not an army. And if they push, then you're in trouble. You have to withdraw quickly. And if it's a non-dismissive environment, a single helicopter dropping off it is not a good scenario to be in. King's Rook, naval diplomacy doesn't work versus the Borg, and defined as a Borg fighter. That's certainly what it's conceived as. But still, it's capable of being used for naval diplomacy. Just remember all the missions which were done into the um, Gamma Quadrant with... Especially those ones involving Quark doing negotiations for trade. How effective is Switzerland's Navy in the diplomatic role? Really, really not. They really don't do much of it. At one point they considered doing more of it, but they really don't. They don't their scenario doesn't really depend on it. Strump. How does the conduct of the crew ashore matter to naval diplomacy? Can they be used to spread money into the economy to promote goodwill? Yes, of course they can. And 
conduct ashore is critical. You want good headlines. You want people doing good. Um, so you do tend to try and keep them on as tight a leash as possible. But also you have to remember that they are sailors going ashore after months at sea. So you sometimes have issues, but you can work with it. And it does matter, again, that the sailors are often the first impression of people of... Uh, especially if you're dealing with communities, the wider population, which might not travel as much, especially in certain places in the world. So sailors from a nation, another nation turning up are going to be how they judge that nation by. It's important. Bionhard X-Ray. So, do you see the loss of Bonhomme Richard as a big impact to the US Navy? Assault ships seem to make not make the headlines like a Nimitz, but I would think they're very important for a show of force. They're incredibly important for a show of force. Um, she's also one of the critical F-35 vessels they have, which gets their F-35s forward, especially without the sea being, having entered service really that well. Um, I'd say... Her flight deck's a bigger loss for the US Navy than her well deck, because they've got plenty more well decks, and they've got well decks in reserve. That flight deck, though, which could take F-35s, is going to be something difficult to regenerate. Especially as they were hoping to get up to six. And now they are back down to four, because one is about two years away from being properly in service. Worked up. Good evening, Ian. How are you doing? Hope your daughter's okay. Um... It's just, you know, it, it, it's going to be a big impact, but how's it going to be impact them is going to depend on how they approach it. Uh, I am very interested by the fact they keep going, oh, no, no, we can still save the ship. We can still save it because I don't think they want to admit they can't. But looking at the damage. Yes, there are very important sections which haven't been damaged by the fire, which is very good. But considering its listing and all the other stuff and the sections which have been damaged by the fire and it got pretty, uh, it got very hot and the manner, uh, da damage amount of the understructure, I'm wondering about the cost of repairing it all because the trouble is the middle section kind of ties everything together and has a lot of stuff in there. And I think you might have to be, you might be talking about not only rebuilding the whole middle section and probably taking out a large amount of steel and replacing it because you can't be sure again how strong the steel which remains is. But also, you might well be talking about a complete rewiring of the ship, a complete rebuilding of certain, uh, definitely of the lift shafts, parts of the well deck, all sorts of. It, it just it's it just doesn't seem to be like it's a likely scenario. Vision, come government. In Starfleet, a cruiser is a multi purpose for national security, just one of the many missions it performs. The, the fine is stripped down to just weapons with minimum crew comfort. Yes, but I said it was functioning as a light cruiser. Not that it was a light cruiser, but functioning as. If you look at how it's used in the DS9, especially against the Marquis, that's basically functioning in a light cruiser role. New IKB four for some do. North Atlantic looks busy. Could be a third happy time. We hope it won't be. We really hope it won't be. Um, it's not true. The melting Arctic is going to uh, uh, re-ice opening the Arctic ice sea lanes will be an interesting change in dynamics. It could well have a big impact on many things which are going on in the world, but it could also have less of an impact than some people are talking about. Because the trouble is, it still ices up, and it still gets pretty difficult up there, and whilst in theory it works very well as another route to go around, in practice, it's an unknown route. It's yet to be fully charted, it's yet to be definitely not fully developed, and... Sometimes issues happen with weather. How's the crow? Hello to Western Australia. <laughs> I 
the Toronto, the melting arthur guys going to evidence. Yes, it will change the dynamics. I think we talked about that. Uh, Veteran soon with the Dutch Java Sumatra Berenfia in the 30s as a secondary role of naval diplomacy strongly used, follow, uh, followed or was the only person to defend against the IJN very heavily naval diplomacy orientated. Remember, the Dutch were basically planned there. They had a two string line for defense in their of their territories from Japan. One, raise the cost of attacking them so that Japan might lose enough they don't want to end up in a, in a fight with one of the bigger powers after they've damaged lots of stuff that are fighting the Dutch. And secondly, be of use to the other, uh, to the Allies. So go make friends with them, with the other powers who might protect them. Vision. Ah, oh, Strub. That is actually mentioned by Captain Rory O'Connor, RN, in his 1930s book, How to Run a Big Ship. He states that British uh, sailor is the best ambassador. That's true. And quite a lot of naval officers became ambassadors. That's correct. The fine in the, is, it, if anything, the first dedicated warship in Starfleet. Uh, we can carry on this all the time. I would say, yes, she's definitely very much orientated for the warfighting role. But that doesn't mean she can't do the diplomacy role. She loses a lot of the science capabilities and a lot of the medical capabilities. But she has spaces which can be used for conducting diplomatic meetings and she can do the presence. I, this is why I very much emphasize her as a light cruiser. I said she functions in the light cruiser role. I wasn't say cruiser role, I said light cruiser. And there is reasoning behind that and how she's used. Osprey 28. Theoretically, they could use a test bed, providing they get it operational again. Yeah, that's providing they get it operational again. Um, and as Richard uh, King Root says, the latest images in the interior are bad. A lot of bent and warped walls. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's going to be very, very expensive, whatever they do with it. SN uh, SN Pi, Dr. Clark, do you think they will do a refit, as in a la RN style, the save USN fate? Uh, promise not a completely new ship. Anchor is the same. That would pretty much what they would have to do. It might well be the engines and all these things, but you know, yeah. Staff Thompson, uh, Dust Clark. So Define is really a daring, um, probably. Actually, that's no, probably a tribal daring is probably what it's closest to. It's got enough, uh, more probably, maybe more battle class, maybe battle class, really, more than anything. Mango and Dust Clark. You said the diplomatic cruisers don't need speed. Could you expand on that? I would have thought the diplomatic mission would require being credible a trade interdictor sport. Well, actually, you need that for the credible for your cruiser role, but not for the diplomatic role. Okay? For the cruiser, speed is important as a trade commerce role. But if you're just turning up to do the, me uh, do the meeting greet and discussion, you turn up. That's what matters. What matters is you get there. And you have to remember... That most of the cruisers, when they're doing the diplomatic mission, are actually tootling along at about 16 to 18 knots. They're not doing the high speed runs. It's very rare. It's like Mr. HMS Birmingham is a is the example at Singtel. To get there on time, she tootles along at 30 plus knots the entire way. And gets there. But that is when they're needing to react to in a second. If they're just doing the diplomatic meet and greet missions, the going from port to port to port saying hello and basically saying, I just came to say hello and that sort of stuff, then you don't need it as much. Let's run for. I still think they should have forcibly sang, uh, have forcibly sang in harbour like Congress designer wanted to do do in New York. New York, water damage is easier to deal with than fire damage, mm, probably. But it would have been very difficult to do, especially with the minimal number of crew they had on time. That's the thing. This is the ship which was in harbor, undergoing maintenance and refit, had minimal crew aboard, had all sorts of doors, all sorts of things open. You're at your Ability to deal with the damage and deal with the pillar is very severely restricted. I'm 
Sangasunum. What would be required to move the Bonham Richard name to another similar ship? Is there any kind of ritual? Um, it would be called a rededication and christening ceremony of another ship. Um, I have a feeling there are a couple of ships at the moment which everyone's considering renaming. So there are options for renaming ships. Thomas Ratner, why does Russia do port visits to Kazakhstan? Their base is right next door. Because their base is right next door, so it's a good place to go visit. Usually they send the smaller ships to go along and play them and keep, make sure they keep Kazakhstan friendly. Right? We turn up, we do training with you. And it's the same reason King's Rook, well, US does port visits to Canada. Yeah. Hello, Federico. Awesome. Could an aircraft launched from a CV, CVN, be used as a form of diplomacy? They often are, but it's... The example I would give... Sorry, that was painful. How long have you since I've been playing with UCD games to play? It's actually got dust on it. All right, let's take Claire's back up there. And that there is... This. And basically, you have one country planning on invading another. The British have, a fly, uh, have aircraft fly over it. That's used as a version of deterrence. Basically, it's going, right then, yes, you can take the local forces. You really can take them. We know you can. But can you take on a Royal Navy aircraft carrier, loaded the bear, ready to come in and take names? And if they're providing support to the local forces, do you really want to be there when it happens? It caused them to back, back down. And here's a, oh yes, no, major cost driver for military equipment is electronics. And if they get wet, they need to be replaced completely. Yep. To Joyce. Um, hello, 1971. The other issue with the Northwest Passage is that Canada doesn't want to pay for search and rescue up there unless we are able to charge for passage. The US opposes to this. Yes. To be honest, I can understand the Canadian and the American position on this one. But I firmly believe Taiwan is um, uh, is not in a good position. There's no way Taiwan can make it past 2049 the way things are going. So by peace or by war, Taiwan is a goner. I'm not so sure about that. I think in a nicest way, it all depends on how quickly, if the Chinese do invade, how quickly they manage to take over. If they don't manage to take over quickly, if they manage to suffer losses, and they get delayed, and other powers get involved, then China could be in a lot of trouble. And remember, there are a lot of countries which could be very, very worried about the concept of China being able to take somewhere over by force and just keeping it. There are a lot of countries which would find that very, very problematic. So I think myself that China... Uh, is probably looking to try and coerce them into falling in line, but I'm not sure if they're actually going to manage it. So I think they might end up going the war route, but I hope they don't. In which case, I expect it to be by 2030, probably. Taking place after that um, could cause issues for the 2049 plans. There's a good example, a good article by Alessio Paltolano on the issue, which I sort of agree with some of the logic of. Um, well, uh, very regretful. Is it literally when a ship meets the others at sea and exchange waves, or when they don't? That, to an extent, can be part of it. Um, Oliver Pike, do you think BHR will be scrapped or have a syntax? I think it might be sunk as a reef or something if they do end up getting rid of it. I don't think scrapping it will be acceptable to the public, and especially after all this thing. And I'm not sure if a Syncex would be acceptable to the crews. After people got injured trying to fight to save it, I think they're going to have to turn it into something. 
Um, there is a, the Northwest Passage isn't that economical. It's very similar and shallow in a lot of places. It requires a lot of maneuvering and navigation. You're unlikely to see it and become a major shipping route. That's my theory about the ones around Russia as well. Uh, very soon, with the Swedish uh, Trekona class and their origin, did Sweden plan use of naval diplomacy? Was Gotland, after the change from seaplane cruiser, used for the same? Pretty much, yes. Sweden did like to get involved in, na in naval diplomacy. It was sensible for them. Uh, vision. The old armoured cruisers had poor speed compared to new treaty cruisers, but their size allowed for them to do presence missions in the 1920s, especially in China. Neil Woodall, do you think a lack of training of the diplomatic corps by extension lack of understanding capabilities is more dangerous to the mission than not sending the right ship? Yes. You need to they need to understand what the navies can do, and the navy needs to understand what their mission is. You need a lot of work together. There's, remember, when Britain was doing it in the 1920s and 1930s, it was there was a lot of links up between the Foreign Office and the Royal Navy. There were a lot of connections between the senior civil servants, the senior diplomatic corps people, and the Navy talking about how they're going to do things. There's a lot of communication going on, a lot of interaction, a lot of understanding, which was already building upon generations of working together. So yes, we're talking about 1920s and 30s, but honestly, they'd started working together prior to Napoleon, during the Napoleonic Wars, you really start to see the Foreign Office and Navy starting to link up and work hand in glove. And it sort of really does work that way the whole way through. Uh, go on, Eagle. How's the pizza? It was lovely. Tonight's going to be KFC. Confidential. The best and worst examples of the Posey in history, or are its effects too subtle? Um, okay. Best example of naval diplomacy in history, I would say, if I was going to use the examples, I'd probably use the British ones, and I'd go for things like, well, I'd say one of the best examples was, of course, the um, Great White Fleet, but I'd also say the British in terms of managing Japan and their rise of Japan and managing to prevent war for about a dozen or so years. And I would say the British relationship in South America up until about the 1960s, which was entirely based upon the naval strength of Britain in the South American division, which allowed us to, nicest way, equal America in terms of influence down in South America. Which the Americans didn't seem to like and were unhappy about, but you have to consider, when we left, then other nations have started moving in there to become the second power with a presence down in South America. And you have to wonder whether the Americans were a little bit of short-sighted and not going to the British. Yes, we really like you down there. Please stay down there. Please still keep having a presence. Because if you've got both us and you, then if nations feel they that you aren't helping, they can go to Britain. Rather than if you aren't helping, they go to Russia or China an issue. <sighs> Worst example of naval diplomacy? The raw of South America since the 1970s for Britain. And... <sighs> I'd argue the recent issues in the Straits of Hormuz. If Britain had no, Britain knew what it was going to get involved in, knew what it was going to be doing. If it had started deploying something before it had even done it, so that by the time the, the the Iranians formulated a response, there was already two ships out there to go. We're here. You really want to get anything started? It would possibly stop them trying anything in the first place. Jerison, do any navies cross train or visit with Mongolia? No. Dr. Clark, eh, John Abbott, Dr. Clark, is renaming a ship still considered bad luck? Um, not usually. We we don't prefer not to do it, but it can be done necessary. Ben Grung, Dr. Clark, uh, 
Also, I saw an article suggesting you might be forebasing entrance between Lisbon and Far East Asia. Where are we most likely? India, Australia, Singapore. I don't think we will be forward basing. I think we'll be rotating a ship out there. I think if we're going to be forward basing anything, it'll be a Type 23 or a Type 31 out there. But, um, yeah. Seth Thompson, uh, Clark, I cannot remember the last time the RN-RCN did a joint tour port stop here in Canada. We had an RCN frigate for the lakes last year, but that was, that was rare. Um, I think the Royal Navy has visited Canada quite recently. Frederico Vega. Also, would the Graf Spey actually qualify uh, uh, qualify in that concept of ships that look a bit a lot better than what they are and useful for port calls and diplomacy? I would say it does. They look a lot better than they actually are. Um, hmm. Kevin Friday. Uh, do you, the clock, do you consider disaster relief of all naval diplomacy when consist conducted using naval ships like LPDs? Yes. I consider it a form of naval diplomacy whenever it's conducted. It's, in the nicest way, the Navy showing up and being very friendly. It's part of it. As I was talking about in the extended video, it isn't, it's being both a good thing and a good thing for you. It's a good thing for the local area, so that's a, it's a win-win scenario. It's turning up and helping, but it's also leaving an impression in local minds that you are a helpful, friendly nation. Just sending a check doesn't leave that bigger impression, but it's still being friendly. Whereas turning up and helping has a long-term benefit to you as well as a benefit to the locals, so it's a win-win scenario. And that's the thing. A lot of naval diplomacy is about generating a win-win scenario, a win for both sides. And this is where actually China is at a weak spot because they really don't think like that. It's always got to be a win-win for China and they're not so worried about the other side. But for Britain, if for any other one, you can make it a win-win for both. See, right. Some was on Kitty Hawk in San Diego waiting to transfer to USS uh, G. Washington, but she caught fire and birthing. Remember, one nuke sub had several fires in her galley that killed at least one sailor. Ouch. Submarine fires are really not nice. They're really nasty. How old is Bomb Harm Richard? Um, possibly, okay, possibly the new underwater relief. Uh, she's quite old, but not that old. She's about, I think, 30 odd years, roughly. Um, Now, as a can like you look at the USN helping the 2004 tsunami, 2011 Operation Tomachi, or other countries helping US during Hurricane Katrina? Bingo. Old Richard, Dr. Clark. To what extent are today's RN deployments prioritized to support NATO and allied nations policies as distinct from purely MOD directed operations? It's about 50 50 going on, and I would say NATO is part of the MOD direction. And uh, we don't have as much of a link up with the Foreign Office as we used to. They are starting to bring it back in, but it's very much difficult to bring in. King's Rook. Um, very much. The Great White Fleet was in the ocean, and when a major earthquake it, it hit Italy, the fleet went to flank speed to reach Italy to help out. Yeah. Uh, to France, a lot of people surrounding countries, uh, in surrounding countries, Malaysia, Singapore, Burma, seem to support China's claims on Taiwan and see Taiwan as an American imperialist bulwark on Chinese territories. Interesting enough, everyone I've spoken to from Malaysia, Singapore, and Burma do not think that. Uh, in fact, most of them see Taiwan's independence as a good thing to continue because it keeps China distracted from pushing other things in other areas. That's the problem. Because if the Chinese rule is not whether those people want to be part of China, but whether they are a significant Chinese community, then you have a problem. Because if you're Malaysia, if you're Singapore, if you're Burma, you have a significant ethnic Chinese communities. You'd rather not China start deciding that that's the criteria for them taking control of an area with military force. Gone Eagle, what is BHR? USS Bonhom Richard, LHD-6. Um, the IKB forces in Taiwan would turn into the unholy love child of Warsaw, Stalingrad, and Vietnam for China. Could well do, but I still think the worst one is whenever they decide to threaten Nepal. Uh, that is not somewhere I would invade under any circumstances. 
In fact, if anyone tried to ever order me to invade Nepal, I would first of all resign whatever commission I'd given them the right to order me, then go and volunteer with the Nepalese army. It'd be safer. SM Pai, Dr. Clark, wasn't Sir Sidney of the RN in the Napoleonic War performing part Navy, part diplomatic, and part amphibious assault force roles? But didn't it bankrupt him when the RN disavowed him? Uh, it wasn't the RN stuff which, which bankrupted him. It was the diplomatic stuff because he was being paid as a Navy captain but not paid as an ambassador, but doing the ambassador work. So eventually he got uh, gets money for it. Eventually to pay him. So he went, bad luck. US the square sub pre war, lost the salvage and renamed US the saltfish. Quite six for Model 2, so. 26 men lost in, uh, in CERN, but uh, successful sailing 33 sailors forward. Hmm. Uh, your HMS Betis gets sunk prior to World War II. I think only about three or four people survive. Uh, and she sinks in an accent. And then she's actually sunk during World War II as well. Re uh, refloated, renamed, and sunk, uh, sinks. Uh, Jeff Beeler, the USN uh, just commissioned the American class part of carrier Tripoli. Yes, they've commissioned her, but that's not her in service. It's going to take two or more years for her to work up to full service. She's commissioned as a ship in the US Navy. That doesn't mean she's ready to serve. That means she's been commissioned. She's on the books. They could furiously send her to war, but she isn't going to be at a fully ready ship for about two to three years. And that would only get them back to five. They've been planning on operating on six in two to three years' time. Now they're going to be operating on five in two to three years' time, so they're currently on four. It makes a difference in terms of deployments. John Abbott, thoughts on last class cruisers? They're actually pretty good for the diplomatic enforcement mission if you still wanted to use them for that. Confidential 1207, thanks for the answer. I have more readers soon. Good luck. Enjoy the re uh, reading. Hmm. gone eagle. Maybe in the sixties, but since Cambodia, Lot Laos and Vietnam went communist, uh, the majority of ethnic Chinese people in Asia became anti communist refugees. Um hmm. it's far as, well, as far as shit fires in yes, this forest I think is one of the worst and somewhat unavoidable events. Definitely, yep. It's a by Dr. Clark. How much favour does gifting of second-tier warships to island nations buy? Depends if they can actually use them. This is why the river-class OPVs are pretty good. If Britain, could, Britain could probably keep churning those out, afford to, and give away the older ones as gifts, or use them for reservists. Um, either way, it would be quite a good thing for them to do. Because it doesn't co they don't, wouldn't cost that much if you get them going, and most island nations could support them. Right, Jeff Beeler, RCN diplomacy, uh, diplomacy deployment subbed uh, the China Sea, frigate and airstricts to Southeast Asia via the Tone Strait. Somali pirate duty and NATO in both Black and Baltic, Black Sea and Baltic. Yep, RCN are trying to do their good, They'll do some good stuff. Right, I'll be back in a second. Um, I'm at Nihuza's double uh, double statement. Ow. Ooh. Right, that's news, isn't it? 
I mean, was, what is the Italian naval diplomacy like? They always seem to try and make the Mediterranean turn in lake again. That is pretty much what their naval diplomacy concentrates on, making the Italian, making the Mediterranean Mare Nostrum. It is very much what they focus on. Jerison, aren't the Taiwanese, South Koreans, Japan, Malaya, Singapore in the Five Dragon Pact? I, I think so. I think there is something there going on. There is it. There's a CP140 doing sanctions efforts around Korea still. Hmm. Cool. Uh, T. Joyce, ninety seven one. A few years ago, the Philippines was hit by a hurricane, and with four uh, within four hours of the hurricane passing, U.S. carriers started landing relief supplies. Is positive naval diplomacy like this as powerful as threats? Yes. In fact, it's more powerful in a way. Vision. America has a very large ethnic Chinese community. Yeah, there's all sorts of issues there. Off topic, Old Richard. Uh, did I detect yours and the Mighty Jingles Golden Voice and Drax New Jutland Part 1 episode? You did detect mine. Going in the dog Nepal actually seems friendlier towards China than India right now. That's because China has stopped threatening Nepal. Because China has learned that every time they threaten Nepal, they laugh at them. So, um... That's quite disquieting to the Chinese. And so Nepal can afford to be friendly to the Chinese because if they try to do anything, then they have to face a load of angry Gurkhas. And the, the Chinese have sensible, uh, have sense things in it. They, they, they have sensibilities about this. Um, it's not the government you have to worry about if you invade Nepal. It's the local population. <sighs> What's left of you can be dealt, will be dealt with and rounded up by the police force. Uh... Nepal, not a good place. Rich Hughes, uh, Dr. Clark, does the Navy have an equivalent to Shrivenham Military College? Uh, yes, Shrivenham Military College. Shrivenham. It's the defense, uh, it's the defense studies department of King's College London, runs the higher education for the most of the all the combined all three services. Um, it used to be at Greenwich. Um, didn't the RN shop off, um, shop off Brazil in eighteen nineties and tell them to end slavery? Uh, yeah, at certain points they did. Better assuming. Thoughts on a possible war between India and China? As we keep talking about China, how do you see the naval part of that? Uh, what do you see? Um, SEA uh, five. Southeast Asia doing in that case. Well, in that case, if there's a war between India and China, you can guarantee the Indian Ocean is going to be turned into an Indian lake very quickly by the Indian Navy. The Chinese are going to have to either fight in it to get their resources, or they're going to have to read resources around the world. The interesting scenario in a war of India versus China, what does Britain do? Because if Britain gets involved, then in the nicest way, that shuts off the Falklands route for their stuff from Africa. And it, it also makes it very difficult for them to get it other ways. Um, in which case, they then have to take the fight to the Indian Navy, and that's going to be a very big match in the Southeast Asia. And I have a feeling different powers would go different ways, depending. They would probably try for neutrality if they could, but if they got forced, they might well end up siding with the Indians more than the Chinese. Because I think the Americans would probably come in on the side of the Indians. And therefore, if you've got a choice between America and India on one side and China on the other, most nations in Southeast Asia will probably think, well, it's better to be that way. Um. Jerison, sorry, no. The, uh, since the communists got voted out of power, the anti-communists Ray, Gurang, and Limbu, the Gurkha clans, are closer to India for obvious reasons. Yeah, they are a lot closer to India in some respects. But they are friendlier with China than India. Um, they're, friend uh, they're friendly with China than India is friendly with China, if you know what I mean. They've got a better relationship with China than India has, relation has with China, but they have a better relationship with India than they do with China. Um, John Emmett, does the USN need to look at adapting the LHD design to match the Queen Elizabeth class? Not really, a moment. Hello, Fox Gamer. Hello from Belgium. Well, hello to Belgium. I've also got Carl Gangon on here from Bel who's in Belgium. So, you know, there's, I'm getting a couple of listeners in Belgium. That's quite fun. Um, 
Gunny, the Chinese don't care about Nepalese communists. Hmm. Hmm. See what was it? Our Atrasark Royal just mentioned in, in to Sirkarov of Indonesia that lowered its is. Uh, probably lots of things happened off the coast of Indonesia in the 1950s. It could well have been Arctic Royal. Might have been one of the others. Probably Victorious if it wasn't Arctic Royal. This one's called Out of Curiosity. Those that you spoke to about China, were they academics or political figures? I ask as the people I spoke to are much are not much more than peasants. I wonder if it's a political opinion. Uh, mostly actually engineers. Mostly engineers um, I've spoken to out there. A uh, few academics, a few politicians, a few military, but mostly engineers. Vast majority of the engineers. I teach a lot of them at Kingston University. I have a lot who come to the UK for engineering degrees in the master's department there. Um... Jono, what would a modern take on the Alaska class look like? Uh, a souped-up Zumwalt. <laughs> New music, Jeffy. I'm saying it's becoming a major focus of the ASEAN's operations. Yeah, probably. Go on, Eagle. Uh, the CPC does, uh, does not just support any communism across the globe, you know. No, they don't. They're very picky. They like ones which will do what they tell them to do. If they don't do what they tell them to do, they don't like them. Calm Gasper, Doug Clark. The people from the hood you spoke to about... Uh, what they think about Korean unification. Um, they think it's a nice idea, but most uh, it's kind of interesting. Most of the older people I know from South Korea are still very keen on it. Most of the younger people really don't think, don't want it, really don't think about it uh, in terms of they see it as different countries now. And it's going to be interesting as the generation splits come through because it's been such an idea for so long time the idea is that there's supposed to be a majority to support it in South Korea, but I'm not sure if there's going to always be a majority to support it. Because they see the quality and standard of life so different that they look at what's happening in Germany, uh, especially still to this day with Eastern Germany versus Western Germany and how that's been unified and the issues that that's brought up, and they wonder if they really want to go through that. Because they have quite a nice quality of life in South Korea. Uranus, um, it's set up differently than a lot of our countries, and it means how policies form. Yeah. Ben Graham, last question before food. What is more effective? Naval diplomacy. Um, Semi-regular large ship visits versus two times to three times the OPV count and permanent basing in more areas. Uh, the, best, uh, the best is a consistent presence, okay? With the larger ship's visits. So basically... If you can have, if we, I was Britain and I was running Britain with all my finances, etc. As you saw in the fleet when I was proposing in my dream fleet, I had two Type Thirty Ones and two River Class forward base in Singapore, going around doing regular visits, and I could have a carrier group or a few stars group come out and visit yearly every eight every eighteen months to two years. So every eighteen months to two years, I demonstrate I've got power. You listen to me because the big boys can come along when I need them to. But I consistently have a permanent presence in the region going around going, hello, do you want to exercise? Do you want to do diplomacy? Do you want to do this? Da, 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 da. Hello, hello, how are you doing? We're going to deal with drugs. We're going to deal with this. We're going to help. Yeah, here, dun, dun, dun. We're going to wander around. And that's how you do naval diplomacy if you want to do it well. Jade Richardson, if Nepal had to fight China in it, it would fight China. There are too many Tibetans in Nepal. Mm. Them and a lot of other groups. They would fight. They will fight anyone who gets into their troubles in their area. There's, there was an incident a couple of weeks ago with India, but that was because the Indians went into the Nepal, Nepalese area, and the Nepalese do not tolerate it at all. There is none of. This. It's kind of interesting. The Indians are almost expecting Nepal to react how they're reacting to China, and the police don't. They have a, you cross the line, bye-bye. You're gone. No, no. You ain't coming across it. This is our area. Ours. May not be much, but it's ours. Get out. 
And they have to, because there is a precedent, and they know this. If they set the precedent that India is able to do it, then China will start to do it. They can't afford for either side to think they have the rights to do it. No matter one which one they're friendly with, they can't have the rights to do it, because that causes a problem. Hmm. J.P. worst diplomatic failure? Valparaiso in 1866. RN trying to protect local trading partners, a UK diplomat more focused on saving Spanish civilians from Chileans. Uh, result, dollars of damage to UK mansion. Yeah, but that's when you see... It, the trouble is, naval diplomacy works best when you have the foreign office, the ambassador, and a navy working hand in glove. When they stop communicating and not working together, and one side's not informing the other properly what's going on, that's when you get problems. Same wasn't. India is trying to throw its weight around in Nepal, uh, e.g. restricting delivery of necessary goods. Nepal is less annoyed by the Chinese, but that would change swiftly if their land was threatened. Bingo, that, this is the point. Nepal is very, very independent. And thank, frankly, I think Nepal would like to build a proper airport in Nepal somewhere that could take um, larger aircraft coming in. But they haven't yet got one of decent size, I understand it. Sometimes, sorry, um, that's not, sorry to, uh, sorry, put you in my pocket and the chat jump back. By chance, have you seen my SNR Arctic LHD comment? I think I have and think I've answered it, but if I haven't, please say again. I'll spray. Well, reunification will be really damaging for South Korea. Yeah. Economically speaking, yeah, that's the trouble. Um, Versus, uh, sorry. In the 30s, did the Axis try to conduct much naval diplomacy, or could they not compete the RN in numbers and the ability to conduct naval diplomacy? Pretty much that's the problem, and also they had limited ambitions about it. The Italian Navy really wasn't allowed to structure in this sort of form. And the Germans really didn't get involved in it as much. Well, actually, they could have probably done a bit with doing a bit more. A lot more, especially if they are planning on operating as they did in World War II. Um, or well, initially in World War II. There's some, uh, Jerusalem. Jeff Biller, since Gulf War One, the arsenal has shifted from focusing on anti submarine warfare with NATO to general purpose ships on presence missions around the world. That they have, but they're now looking at ASW back, but still general, but strong general purpose element. So I'd say they have a scars were quite good at ASW. Jeff Biller, KGB, are you Drax Jutland in Drax the Jutland video? Lots of very young sailors have served in the battle. Hmm, that would mean good if KGB had been. So was, Nepalese do not want to be another Kashmir. They don't want to be another anything. They are happy being uh, being um, Nepal. And German, the mountain people love their neutrality in Nepal and Switzerland. They do. And actually, those two states have a surprisingly long relationship, sponsored in part by the British. So again, if I was India and China, I wouldn't get involved because you might actually piss off the Swiss. And we all know the Swiss are excellent at diplomacy. <laughs> Gone, Ingle, which is why China doesn't care about conquering Nepal. They'd much rather build them tunnels through the mountains and get to trade in and, and influence Nepal that way. And mainly because trying to conquer them would not be that good. They have tried in the past, but they've given. I think they've sort of stopped it sort of recently now. Well, they have tried actually not that long ago, but you know they get they don't like it. They the people just laugh at them. Let's see one. What single RN ship could have prevented the Falklands War if based on the Falklands? Pick anything. Um, if there'd been a county class destroyer base down there permanently, that would have stopped it. The idea, as I was saying in the extended introduction, was if the Royal Navy had kept up a continual presence and had based down there a, a frigate or a couple of Leander class wandering around, or Whitby class, or one, any other type 12s wandering around making friends with everyone, the fact that they were there would have prevented matters. It would have made the thing okay. So to take the Falklands, you now have to not only sink both these ships, you have to, um, uh, that are making, have made friends with us, are going to be close by, 
you have to then take a shoot the marines on shore. So you raise the cost of attacking the forces down there. And also, I have a feeling if the Royal Navy had continued to keep their presence down there, it would have made the Argentinians realize that Britain was committed. And you have to remember, half the reason the Argentinians do what they do is they think the British won't do anything about it. So if they had, if they thought the British were actually would actually do something about it, because they saw how interested the British were in it and how they probably wouldn't have been a Falklands War. And it's far cheaper to keep presence down there than it is to actually fight a war. New IKB 4472. Should the UK offer to help build a big airport in Nepal? If we wanted to really annoy the Chinese and the Indians, that would be one thing to do. It would twerk, uh, tweak the Indian tail and it would really, really upset the Chinese, probably. But it would be one thing we could offer to do. Help them build a decent-sized airport so they could then have their trade go internationally. Basically, you need something big enough to take a a 737-type sized aircraft uh, so you can start having proper ecotourism, but also you can have proper import-export of goods by air so they don't have to rely on road and rail from other countries if they don't want to. They can. and the Basically, the thing is you would normally rely on road and rail from other countries because it's a lot cheaper. But it would mean if those other countries start to try and apply pressure by raising prices or causing cost issues, then suddenly they, there is a point at which if they raise it too high, it becomes cheaper for stuff to fly in and your economy adjusts. It's not great, but it does. Lieutenant McCarthy, the Missouri made an around-the-world cruise after the recommissioning in 86. I'm guessing the intent was to intimidate the Soviets. That said, what did the Soviets think of the metal those hours? I don't think it was to intimidate the Soviets. It was about reassuring everyone and showing how present the Americans were. Also, you have to remember, a battleship, whatever it is, can go into more ports than an aircraft carrier can. Because a battleship can defend itself and has a lot of armor if anything happens, kicks off. An aircraft carrier is not something you want to send into someone else's port. Unless you're real, they're really, really friendly. So you know your battleship going around is quite a good way of reminding how powerful you are. Soviets scared of them? No. Wary of them? Yes. There's something you have to think about. And they raise the sort of the cost of attack again because they do have a lot of armor. So maybe your big missiles will damage them, but also they have a lot of armor. So it's going to take a lot of big missiles to take them out. They couldn't really do anything that uh, new cruisers couldn't have done, but they were had a lot more status than new cruisers would have done. That's the thing, John Emmett. Uh, different. Kashmir has the issue that the uh, ruling prince, when he died, had Kashmir go to India, but the majority of the people, yeah, yeah there's all sorts of issues in Kashmir. There's a whole debate going on about Tibet at the moment. I'm, I'm fairly sure Britain did recognise Tibet as a sovereign state at one point. Um, could Finland in the 30s have conducted naval diplomacy given their fleet? If so, would they even be conducting it with um, only Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, or some great large power? Probably some of the larger powers. Uh, probably Sweden and Norway and Russia. Presumably, would there be targets? Um, but also, it'd be the same sort of, sort of going around the world a bit, being a bit of a presence. They couldn't really with the fleet they had, but they could have. They built slightly longer leg ships and had a slightly bigger fleet. Sam Wilson. Uh, Historically, when China is strong, Tibet is part of China. When China is weak, it pretends to be independent. It is independent usually when it's... um. And China is weak, but it's still a part of the expanded Chinese Empire. It's not really 
part of China in their in in their mindset. That's the thing. But the trouble is they didn't have a military or really anything that could resist. This is the problem. If they had been thinking like a nation state and looking what was next door to them, um, one would have expected them to have built uh, some sort of formation that could protect themselves. Um, do you think Korea should expand its navy? They have the yards and the money. They are expanding their navy. Their navy is pretty darn big for their size, and is quite capable. It's one of the interesting things that, honestly, China's navy, barring the aircraft carriers and the SSBNs, if you take those away, it isn't necessarily the most powerful navy in uh, in the Far East. It's got the status symbols, but honestly, there's the Chinese, uh, there's the Korean and the South Korean and Japanese navies which together could mount a very big threat to the Chinese if they work together. But that's a big if, because they don't always get along that well themselves. Mm. That's a lot of naval diplomacy to get those two to work together. Uh... Go on, Neil. Ben Grogan, uh, Dust Clock, how would the RN organize a sea lift evacuation of Hong Kong citizens if China decided to go in force? Uh, well, that's technically from a sovereign nation, so that would be war. Unless the British basically put an LPD, Albion or Bulwark, and sat it in Hong Kong Harbour and opened the dock and basically said anyone who can make it to us gets to us and landed a landing craft but still that would not be appreciated by the um chinese and i have a feeling that would cause a lot a lot of that would probably cause a war and that would be considered an act of aggression so you know you don't really want to do that Hmm. Come on, guys. But read Korean, Korean, Korean unification. Last time I knew Japan was worrying that after, albeit long and sweaty, Korean unity, uh, they would face a peer economic and military power. Possibly. Jerishan, is Wales internationally recognised? Is it sovereign? Mm, well, it's internationally recognised, but it ain't sovereign. It's part of Britain, as is Scotland. Um, Oliver Pike, Canterbury Airport has a 3.35 km runway. Even at that altitude, it can already accommodate wide body aircraft. Yeah, that's good. But. <sighs> There is some issue with it. I'm not sure what it is, but I do think there is some issue which needs to be fixed from memory about it taking heavy um, aircraft which are running heavy, which is cargo aircraft. I'm not sure. It's probably the altitude, but maybe with the altitude it needs to be longer to take them. I'm not sure, but I remember reading something a couple of weeks ago about it. Uh, where was it in? It was in... Uh, one of the... Ooh, what was it in? Someone in their police blogs, I read. Hmm. Trent Lunga. So where do things like fishery protection fit now? It'll be a thing post-Brexit for the UK. What's well, a thing for the British now? We have... A fisheries protection squadron already they use quite a lot um fisheries protection is a very big part of naval diplomacy it always has been uh, the first point of naval diplomacy is can you protect your own area and can you look after your own fisheries because uh the first point is to secure those from others so that's a big part of naval diplomacy and dealing with fishing votes the, the war of jenkins ear etc comes like the whole thing is dealing with is quite a load of fraught and fr uh, and uh, uh, fractious scenarios. So, 
It's going to require vessels and it's going to require presence, but it's doable. And it is part of it, and it is do it is the other diplomacy is always part of as I was trying to say, pretty much everything below war fighting and to argue it's arguing even war fighting is part of naval diplomacy. Because you have agreements with other allies, you have to enforce them, you have to enforce those agreements. And those are all going to be by international agreements, which are dip uh, diplomatic, and it's diplomatic enforcement, and it's how you enforce it. And this is why the sea is an international space. It isn't like a border, which is a line and sad on that side, you're British, on that side, you're French. No, 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 it is. Okay, over in these small bands, you're British or French, but in this bit, your international waters, where rules are different and all things are governed by international law, which may or may not actually be written down and may be governed by precedent, and it's all diplomacy. Okay. Uh... Grimmick, about Finland, I've recently seen, uh, seen recently recently photos of their coastal defence ships and subs in Guinea. There was a lot around, a lot around um, Baltic visiting by everyone in the in development. Yeah. <laughs> Grimmick, po uh, coastal po uh, Polish autocorrect on phone. Polish does love to be uh, the phones do love the autocorrect. Jerison, uh, going. The whole world cares. But, uh. Don't know. Hell, I've seen people refer to Japan as a Chinese colony. Oh, don't start that one. That one is definitely going to have more. Any a treaty involving Britain and Russia with regards to the bet is invalid. Golden Eagle, be careful about what treaties you declare as invalid, because I think that's also a treaty which, from memory, recognizes a lot of other things as well, which are still used as precedent today. International law is precedent. Okay, so be careful. Never declare something as invalid unless you're sure what else depends on it. And always be careful about what other treaties relate to that and move up to the through the time. Didn't a USN vessel uh, visit Subic Bay recently? China irked, Philippines not irked. And eh, it often happens. You visit Subic Bay, you say hi. Ben Grung, it looks like, is that not what the offer of British things do all Hong Kong people uh, not le uh, leaving into? At what point are you evacuating UK citizens, not an aggressive act? That's the complication. If they do apply for British citizenship and then the Chinese decide to hold them. But the thing is, the British have very carefully set things up so that they can get to Britain quite easily if they want to. There's already quite a few over here. It's a good thing to welcome the Hong Kong people. They're a nice, they're a nice people. Night Heron Productions for what? Hello, Night Heron Productions. For what reason did the RN station carriers east of Suez, Singapore, recently during the sixties? I understand the presence factor, but any particular reason for CVs in case of a Honduras scenario? More of a case. Yeah, it's going to sound strange. It's a, a part of a presence factor, but also it's part of the global trade and you're dealing with the swelled of class and these sort of issues. And we always talk about, when we're talking about, oh, there is my book. I had it, exactly this question. When we are talking about the Cold War, we always focus on the Atlantic. But the Pacific mattered just as much and was just as complicated and was just as important. It's the other side of the conflict. It's the other side of the war. You've got issues with 
China, you've got issues with Russia in the Pacific, you've got all sorts of things going. The British keep a major presence in Singapore, in the Far East, literally for that. King of the Rock, re fisheries have also the, the turbo wars come to mind. Yep, they do. Go on, Eagle. Uh. Jeff Beeler, was it endurance being recalled that helped trigger the attack? From what Tony Sheridan said, I could see her trying to ram Argentinian ships. Certainly, that was. Uh, the uh, a final point in contention, but it wasn't just her. Um, it was part of an ongoing scenario of weakening presence in the area, which had been weakening and weakening since World War Two was over. Angus Sonnet, isn't this mystery to the deep right? Uh, to, uh, mystery to the deep night. Yep, it is. At nine o'clock. Do you know? Don't mess with Poland. Hmm. Trench on uh, the Spanish and Portuguese fishing fleets are heavily dependent on UK fisheries, and post Brexit, UK can keep uh, the mouth in negotiation with other countries. Hence my question. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. You can expect there to be a lot of involvement of a lot of uh, patrol vessels, and um, that might be why the Royal Navy keeps ordering more river class at the moment. I expect to see another batch batch freeze ordered at some point soon. I keep hearing different rumors about it. Uh, so, very soon, the Norwegians got much closer to the Shan horse with their destroyer. Granted, she didn't single, I'm an or, but um, still, don't forget that. They certainly did. Jerison, Hong Kong is where the professional, oh, where the majority of the Chinese middle class I know, are, I know are from. Hmm. Interesting. Go on, Ingle, just There won't be max exodus. Those who want to leave, by and large, are youngsters with no BNO passport. Those with BNO tend to be older and established and have less motive to move. Um, the way the British have set it up, uh, those youngster ones are actually going to be able to get BNO quite quite easily if they come to the UK. The way the it's offered to about three point three million, but I think can conceivably widen to up to six million. There's no cap being let put on it, so there's a lot of um, space there and room for wrangling them. The British are quite happy to accept them. And um, as for the people who are established not wanting to come, I would just suggest that my friends who are involved in banking have been saying other things to me. Ben Gregor. Clark, didn't the USN uh, patrol in the Pacific with like three carriers at once at one point in the Cold War to say to Russia, I know you're looking at Europe, don't forget your back door too? They regularly do it. Um, you know, you keep the Pacific fleet force out there and regularly they combine together. Just look recently, two carriers got together in the South China Sea to go, hey, you claim this is your water. Look, we're sailing here completely fine. What are you going to do about it? It's what you do with naval diplomacy sometimes. Sometimes deterrence is literally showing up and going, come on if you think you're hard enough. You don't? Good. Then stop squealing. Uh, John Emmett, what would a modern tribal look like? You'd probably be talking some region of seven to eight thousand tons in terms of capabilities. You'd be talking lots of VLS, lots of gun, uh, probably two deck, uh, two main deck guns, super firing, kind of like the um, Type Thirty Ones are set up, but with outfit not fifty seven meters, but five inches. 
and a lot of firepower stuck into them. But a lot of presence also built into them. So they'd be it'd be an interesting ship. I think they probably have about two helicopter capability, definitely. General, were the Gearing class close to troubles in performance? They were close, but they were designed for the American style of war. They were what the Gearings were what the Americans wanted. They suited them and their style. The Americans, remember, for them, naval diplomacy at this time was something conducted mainly in the Pacific with heavy cruisers and battleships. So they weren't building destroyers like the British were building destroyers for. They were building their destroyers for their war fighting role. Which was heavy on everything. Land protections. Oh good. Brexit British Fisheries talk. Sounds like we're in the setup stages for 2020's reboot of the Cold War. Should be an uh, interesting viewing if nothing else. Definitely. <laughs> It's Ron's fault. The funny thing with UK fishing was it was was it was too small and family run. The continents like Spain and Portugal run larger industrial operations. The UK had long sold fishing quota to who could pay. Hmm. Probably will continue to do so. Uh, Gardening, did you follow the SES standoff in 2016? I've followed several standoffs. There's been lots of standoffs in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea, and that's been constant. And occasionally you would say the Chinese would claim they won. Occasionally the Americans would claim they won. Usually the results is about a draw from both sides. Because that's what you can achieve in naval diplomacy. As long as you can't push them away. But they have to go away before they're not replaced. You can claim you've won. But they can also say because you haven't pushed them away until they've gone home to refit or onto their next task. That they've won. What matters is that for both sides, the other nations looking on, see that both sides are equally committed. They see the Americans are committed because they're prepared to put the ship in the harm's way, and they see the Chinese are committed because the Chinese are prepared to resist the Americans. It's important for people looking on. It's not necessarily going to be even uh, one side or the other wins. Very soon. I think the gearings are more like the battles than tribals. The Allen M's are something I believe a little bit better than uh, a little bit better. And troubles, and they were the class before the gearings. Um, they're still more sort of battle orientated than the troubles, I'd say. Kingsborough, which Starfleet class is most comparable to the troubles? They don't have anything like the troubles. Do not have anything like it. Um, it would need to be a defiant on some sort of a class on steroids or something, or anything to actually make it uh, make it that way. New AKP 472. Am I the only one who thinks the war that Warspide and Texas should have run off and got married after the war? No. No, they shouldn't do that. Mainly because just imagine what the children would be like. SMP, uh, isn't there a US island within a one mile of Russian island in the Alaska region? They, I think, are on the other sides of the international date line. Yeah, there are some very interesting islands in the Bering Straits. SMP, um, Ducklock, and uh, no, I got that one. Uh, Golden Eagle, they were very happy when they did have all those things, when they understood it was going to be a two systems, one nation scenario. Mm, now it's not. China has rushed things, and I think because they've rushed them, they might have lost a significant group of the, uh, of the public. Um, in Hong Kong. Uh, I can understand why they've rushed it due to other context issues, but that's problematic. Aeon 1000, uh, ooh, 10,003. Does the American Love and Naval strategy then go to straight on? Pretty much. Uh, Nighthound Reduction. A Monday tribal should surely have a detachable bow that is also a drone. Uh, that is also a drone, a bow drone you want to send it to, um, to wreak havoc. Oh, that would be fun. That's right. I've sent Coast Guard and fishing boats. Still more politically powerful than they are in North Atlantic. Um, 
You see, this is the thing, as a other ships will testify to, taking on a ship which isn't built or designed for icebreaker standards is not good in a ramming match. Your hull is not designed for that scenario. Their hull is. Your hull tends to be designed for speed. Theirs is designed for smashing into ice. It's not good. So this is why Britain wants the patrol vessels it does. <laughs> Possibly needs to borrow some from the Danish. Um... <clears throat> John, I'm at 10, 15 inch guns. You never know. Richie, do you see torpedo boats? <laughs> John, uh, John, Children of War Spite, a Pixar film. That would be a scary film, though. That wouldn't be for little kids. Just for EU nations are still allies. They will be our allies. This is the thing. It's going to still be an ally. It's going to have to be worked out. Adults will hopefully get around and they'll have diplomatic discussions and things will get sorted out nice and neatly. Eventually, once people start getting over the rhetoric and start talking on both sides, get over the rhetoric. That's the trouble. There's been rhetoric from both sides. Both, to an extent, born out of fear. The EU's that Britain would start a mass exodus if they left. And the UK's out of fear of what the EU keep making statements about. And out of fear of the unknown. Um, both sides, it's fear. And you've got us to get past it and start working together. Hopefully it will. Hopefully, if they're sensible. And that's on both sides. Um, every time I hear all of these standoffs and a notion, I can't help but think of this video I found where a Swedish ship did a good-natured pass on Norwegian ship spraying Norwegians with water. To be fair, they often do spray each other with water, with water if they're allies. They, they still do that. Jeff Beeler, how did Fisher scrapping all the sloops and third class cruisers affect the iron diplomacy mission? It made it terrible. It really did cause a non stop trouble. It Basically, Fisher was the pre architect of what happens in the Cold War, where everything's focused on fighting a war. No one's thinking about what terms of fighting peace is like, what waging peace is like. Um, no one thinking about that. Hi, Martin Dorothy. Um, mm -hmm. Seth Thompson, Dogs Clark, a thirteen ninety. Keep the stuff coming. The Brit doctors have a great. Uh, doctors been great always. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for a drive whilst I taste my break job. Good luck, Stafford. Good luck. Jefferson, uh, go on, Regal. Is it better to be a... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not getting... Uh, Golden Eagle and Jay Richardson. Calm down. We can't refight the, far, the past as much. There are some very strong feelings on both sides, and this is what I think when you're looking at all these issues going around there, in terms of naval diplomacy and in terms of real diplomacy. Strong feelings are good. But it, what's going to be is a scenario of what happens. It's all going to depend on how China plays its hand in Hong Kong and how the British, uh, British have set up a system. Hong Kong to take it or not. If the Chinese go too strong and continue on it, then you could well see a large number of people, maybe not millions, but certainly possibly yeah, hundreds of thousands, heading to the UK. If China then tries to force them to stay or blocks off, that's when you can get problems. And that's what's going This is the scenario you have to deal with. You have to look at what's going on. And Marnus Rook. Canadian flag icebreakers do seem to get rammed a lot, and the ship doing random always comes off worse, i.e. sunk. Yeah, icebreakers do not ram. Do not ram an icebreaker. 
Hang on, which is stronger, hull seal or ice? It's the same for icebreakers. The thing is for icebreakers is that they have a lot of very thick steel and a lot of weighted. The most icebreakers are designed to not do bash and get it out of the way, but they do the whole way through. So most icebreakers actually roll up on the ice and then their weight of their bow cracks it down and then they continue on. So icebreakers are con continue doing as they go forward. It's rare you have them doing that. But it still means they're very, very strong at hull. And they're still far stronger often than most normal most normal ships. Jerison, um, I, I wonder, Dr. Uh, Clark, do you think there is a place in Monday RN for fast patrol ships, boats like the old MTB MGBs, especially if we're going to forward base? Not yet, but it depends how the world develops. If the world keeps developing like it is at the moment, they might need some for the Gulf and Gibraltar and the UK. And if they have a base in Singapore, Singapore. Probably not the Falklands. South Atlantic isn't probably a good place for a small ship like that. You know, a British transport ship discharged. <laughs> uh, we won't go there. Um, Golden Eagle, in the nicest way, language. I realize you're getting passionate, but language. That one's not going to be displayed. Even though you did put in a start, still not going. I've got little cousins and people watching this. Okay? Uh, sorry, just jumped to the whole thing. Right, it's uh, 8 o'clock, so about another 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Ken McGuire, since China seems to have broken its deal with UK and Hong Kong, what is the UK about doing about it? UK is opening itself up to the Hong Kong people. If they want to come to the UK, they can. That's what they're doing about it. We don't have the naval power to go and force it as an issue, but if it, it could become more complicated. It depends what goes on. Uh, Trent Talenko, do you see any role for robo ships in fisheries production? It seems a role that requires people. That's the trouble. It does require a lot of people. It does require people to go it out there. I wouldn't be surprised if robo ships get used as sort of some sort of um, at sea monitoring system. But you can honestly, you, for the same thing, you can probably use a predator drone, and that's probably easier for wide air search. But you're still going to need a manned ship in the region. A great source of Um there's an island disputed between Canada and Denmark war consists of periodic visiting, pulling down the other's flag and leaving a bottle of whiskey. Yes, that is between Greenland and Canada. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. It is an absolutely beautiful summary. And the whiskey gets better every time I'm told. Martin Dorothy, one of my favorite classes of ships. Hmm. Ben Grogan, Dust Clark. Off topic question. With us joining the US future medium lift helicopter, which do you see us favoring? I'm thinking the SB1, as I think the Vela has well, too big a size for SW on a DD. You see, that's the interesting thing. I said, I seem to remember saying the big question is not going to be us getting 
Uh, V22s, it's not going to happen. But what's going to be interesting is what ends up being the replacement pro uh, air helicopter chosen for the Merlin. Long term. For the Puma and the Merlin, it's going to be probably the same type of aircraft. Well, that's going to be the interesting thing, because which of those aircraft is better suited for taking on that role? Because we're going to pick the same airframe. We're going to have a larger fleet of the same type of aircraft. So we'll see. We'll see what comes off it. Vision. China has been losing lots of people for years. Immigration, especially to US, Canada, Australia. Hong Kong would only add to the existing flow of Chinese leaving to other places. There have been a lot. King's Rook, Grace I believe if you go over 200 characters, YouTube splits into two messages and posts them both one after the other. And that is what I've heard. This is a bit confusing for me sometimes because sometimes I get split up by about four or five. Man, I cannot understand that. I always like the Fair Mile Steam Gunboats, but Town Class are my favourites. Hmm, cool. Is France, what do you think of the state of the Israeli Navy and how much influence does it have locally? Actually, it's got quite a bit of influence locally. But the trouble is they have the Egyptian Navy off the one side, which is a lot bigger. Then they have the mess that is Syria. And then they have the Turkish Navy. So to be really influential, they need to be a lot bigger than they currently are. Because they are sandwiched between two quite big, um, I would call regional powers, naval-wise. Type just 1971, Northwest Passage did open up. How should Canada defend and patrol it? Should we build SSNs? Well, you can't really patrol a passage with SSNs. Uh, you would have to build probably more ice level frigates and more uh, the wolf class, and you probably need some more SSKs to have a presence up there. But that would be it. You'd probably be talking about predator drones or some sort of system going across that way. See, Golden Eagle, that is far more acceptable. That's pretty much what you said earlier, but without the language issues. Remember, little cousins watching this. That's what I want. I, I, I do not filter the chat in any way, shape, or form, but little cousins watching this. So certain words, if even in star form, if they're on here, tend to get me ear earache, okay? From, my, uh, from the... Bigger cousins, i.e. the parents of the little cousins. So, please, remember that. I do not, I do not believe in censoring debate, but I, I also like my skin attached to my body. Angerson, I'm worried about racist sentiments making you know, Hong Kong refugees feel unwelcome in UK England. Seriously, I. The trouble is, I'm a white Anglo-Saxon male, so and I freely admit this. So perhaps my experience is different, but I went to a fairly ethnically diverse secondary school. I work in a very ethnically diverse university, and. Yes, there are problems, but I don't see a lot of them. In fact, I see very few of them and from the students I've talked to. There might be more problems in some of the areas in the country, but I don't see as big. And it's kind of strange. Some of the areas I go to, Cornwall and Devon, I see very, very, very little of it. It's a, it, you, if it's ever an issue, it's probably more of an issue in London than anywhere else, really. I don't think that would be a major problem. And we've had, Britain has had Chinese communities and large Chinese communities for centuries now, and we still continue to. They get along very well. How Chinese food is practically a national meal.
Uh, it says Senpai, wouldn't seaplanes be very useful for fishery protection? Cover a large area quickly, but also land anything it could do if they could be used for it. Um, they could be used. Uh, Vision, in New York City, there are 800... Vision, hmm. Chinese New York, about one-tenth of the public total population. That is a lot of... <laughs> Ooh. Jerison, Merlin's a good helicopter spinning away. They are far more reliable than they have a reputation for at the moment. Um, the the Mark 1s were an issue, mainly the electronics, but they now have a policy of basically they get arrived, they get accepted, then they get sent off to a different factory, which takes out all the electronics, rebuilds electronics, and they come into service, and now they've been upgraded to Mark 2s, and they're even better. Um, the next generation are very good, very reliable, actually. Oh, Paul Johnson, we're talking about the ideal class. Oh, they are nice. Um, Alba Sotsi, how a nation that doesn't have a carrier LHD battle groups at hand can do naval diplomacy? I generally about ha only having frigates. You can do naval diplomacy, but it's the levels you can do up to. Carrier battle groups and amphibious task groups allow you to go to the enforcement level of naval diplomacy. But you can do the presence and you can do the strong form of naval diplomacy with frigates, i.e., we we can do the presence mission, and then you can have the first line of strong. If they then ignore you, you don't have anything to go up higher than that. You have to call in an ally to go higher than a frigate. You have that. It's just what how you're talking about is you're limiting your ceiling for how high a level of naval diplomacy of the deterrence of influence you can bring to bear to any scenario. Okay, submarines would work for Northwest Passage. They wouldn't because they'd have to surface. The thing is, if you're talking about controlling a passage, you need something on the surface, and the submarines are not great for surfacing in terms of that reveals their position. The whole point of a submarine is a stealth hunter. The moment it surfaces, it reveals its position. And that's the problem. Back in a second. Just heard something. Who wins trains or icebreakers? Icebreakers. Uh, Ren, have I missed anything? No, no. No, no, no. Sorry to ask for this, but two days ago, Trump took some very hard moves against China. Then just yesterday, there was a massive hack across a lot of Twitter. The timing is very suspicious. Would be keen to hear your thoughts on the subject brief in the next stream. Next one, as I don't expect you to talk on a subject you might not know much about. Um, I might have a chat about it on Sunday. During the brew ships. It was kind of interesting. But not surprising.
All right, then. Mm-hmm. Uh... Uh, Trent Tlanko. Regards, Egypt and Turkey for side of SARS. Six corvettes could eat any of its neighbours with naval line dome systems and 16 anti ship missiles each. This was the lesson of the SAR 5. Yes, to an extent. They could do it, but the trouble is they don't have the numbers for the peace. Remember, peacetime is as much about waging peace is enough about numbers as it is about strength of the individual ships. I've gone over this several times. The war fighting ship is great for fighting a war. But if you're not fighting a war, it's great, but it just isn't. You don't have enough of them. S. M. Pi, Dr. Clark, uh, wouldn't having a carrier on LHC with some stuff, uh, stuff air unit, be great for naval systems? Making a statement at foreign ports will be a great party at each support call. That they are useful for that. They are. That's why they are the statement level slash enforcement level of naval diplomacy. Basically, as high as it can go. Android, that's right. If we are going to forward base naval assets in Singapore, would not we also have our base RFP8 Typhoon on maybe some RM commandos? Probably. But maybe not the Typhoons, because the Singapores have enough of their defense themselves. P8s, again, they probably have their own. Um, and RM commandos, potentially. Especially if we have a literal strike ship in the region. And that will be for basing. But I don't think... I think the thing is, you're thinking about, oh, what can we add to... Can we add... Uh, will P us having P8s and Typhoons out there add anything to the local area? Will they add a lot of complications? They will add. They will add nothing because they already have their equivalents, and they won't they, they add a lot of complications. But ships, they can be useful. Uh, we could should be able to practice deploying them, and should be able to deploy them if they need them. But we don't necessarily need to have them out there because they have their own in peacetime. I wish one of the New Orleans class had been preserved. That and Brooklyn class. Ooh, they would be nice. Oof. Neil Wonder, do you see Chinese carrier manufacturing sector reliance the West have a solid defense naval diplomacy in some of their ventures, i.e. Hong Kong? Um, I have a feeling the biggest threat to the Chinese manufacturing sector is actually 3D printing. Especially when you start to talk about that as a thing, because if 3D printing, the onus becomes on usually having it far closer, the manufacturing to the source, because it's far uh, to the actual customer. So that could cause a lot of trouble for the Chinese economy. Chad is moving very, very fast, and I'm trying to keep up with 10 minutes to go. Ah, all right. Alistair Crow, I like our camera class of capability, but so ugly. My eyes bleed just looking at them. I, I think you've been listening to Drax, um, a Drac on bilge pumps quite a lot. Uh, Bangram, go on the... All right, if you was filling, uh, filling of the Grand Renaissance Dam is more an issue to Egypt than Sudan is in the moment. Hmm. Interesting. Probably. 
Strub, what has been the best US ship for diplomatic missions? Mm. Brooklyn class were actually pretty good for that. Some of their World War pre interwar year 8 inch cruisers were fairly good as well. And go for their 8 inch cruisers in the interwar era. Jeff Hila, how the giant presence frigates progressing as ugly as ever from out of here. Um, all right. Carl Glassman, Dux Clark, a peacetime present ship could be a large US Coast Guard cutter type. That is what they use them for quite a lot. That's why the Coast Guard turn up in so many places around the world. They're being used as present ships because the USN doesn't have enough of them. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I have heard HMS Victory was surprisingly fast and good handling for a first rate, leading to her longevity. Were other first rates comparable to frigates in speed, and why? For a big sort of side. They were often quite fast, but it's quite it's their handling and how nimble they can be, that's their problem. Because they can carry a lot more sail, and they can take out a lot of sail, so they get a lot of space and speed, but, you know, those things. I agree. I think it would be best, but it is about five minutes to go. So, you know, I'll deal with the last, que last questions. Um, Jerry said, Stephanie Wilson, just. Mm hmm. Hmm. King's Rook, that's what, Star Trek question. Intrepid class of present ships? Prometheus class with sp uh, splitting ship's ability removed as tribal equivalent? Um, I'm not sure as the, the Prometheus class would fit as a tribal equivalent. I would say they'd more be fit with a war spike, really, as a battleship sort of scenario, their abilities. Um, Star Trek question. The intrepid class of present ship could well be. Intrepids would be quite good for that one. It's a pleasure to always answer the questions. Uh, Neil Wobble, thank you. Um, let's see. Let's <laughs> uh, see, see what. Going soon. Uh, playing cards with mum and brother. Mum cheats and wins constantly, but still can't tell the difference between four master and mizzen master. Good luck. Going on, 23 for free, but then trade is trade, and that doesn't mean it'll result in military aggression, which it won't. It can do if it's interrupted. That's often the thing. That's often what you use navies for in terms of naval diplomacy. It's your in my trade's been interrupted. Right then. Here's my warship. Please stop interrupting my trade. Ben Gregor. As a quick question from quickly on missile defenses, how far off viable systems are they for ships? Two, five, or ten years, and why? 
Um, honestly, we have the SM3, the Aster 45. There are lots of missiles which can do defense, but the trouble is it's having enough of them. And it's rather the interesting scenario when you got the Chinese keep going, we have a ballistic missile to attack, sh uh, we attack surface fleets. You sort of go, US Navy's actually had the SM3 in, in service longer and updated more, and also has the SM6, which has the capability as well. Sort of In that scenario, the SM6 shifts from being your area defense weapon to your point defense weapon. Your SM3 is your area defense weapon in that scenario, but it does work. It has been tested. It can defend the battle group. But it's, again, how many missiles do you have? How many think and targets are inbound? That's the problem. And do you have the uh, do you have the information early enough to predict where it launches? Because the main thing about an SM3, to get it into the target basket early enough, you need to have the data of the launch quite early. Right then. Speaking of possible, 9.2 10-inch gun cruisers post-war, how would the work in, they have worked in naval diplomacy? They would have been... It's basically a case of, again, you'd have had the scenario that you'd have had frigates or destroyers probably taking over the light cruiser role. Daring class certainly doing of doing the being the sort of present ship turning up most often. And you'd have had the larger cruiser being the thing which turns up as the flagship. So... You have the level of, you would have normally a port visit in a small port of a sloop, in a major port of a light cruiser popping around or whatever. And then if there's a big, if there's a problem, then the flagship, the station flagship turns up and goes, hello, how may I be of service today? It's grades of level. It gives you more levels of deployment. It's a case of naval diplomacy is not a top trunk scenario. It's an escalating racket. So you slowly raise the stakes a small ship comes first, and that's the usual visitor. And if that doesn't work, and there's still a problem, then a slightly bigger ship turns up. And if that's a problem, then an even bigger ship turns up. And if that doesn't work, then maybe a task force turns up but centered on that bigger ship. And if that doesn't work, then you can go to a battle fleet turning up. And if that doesn't work, there's war. Um, that's sort of how it sort of works and escalates up. And it's basically it's showing our increasing level of interest in this incident or in this scenario, what's going on. Um, going up, there are lots of ideas around battleship caliber guns being used in air mountings. Um, if you want a good example, in World War II, Britain used a gun which was from the stock which would support the hood as an AA gun in World War II. So battleship guns have been being used for AA for a long time. Garrison, I would say, honestly, I to an extent agree with that point. Mm, it's half a dozen, one, six of the other in some respects. Um, John Emmett, how much would a 10 inch post World War II cruiser aim at World War One or is that World War II cruiser pain? Weighing probably at around about 14,000 tons, I reckon. Definitely more than 10,000. Um, turning for free, uh, free four, free four. Uh, well, trade doesn't have to be aggressive, but I don't think do think there's a tendency to go for full self-reliance instead of mutual cooperation. And people should be prepared for it. There is a bit of one. Come on, come A SD, a Star Trek funny Romulan president ship. Oh, good lord, we're not going there. Hang on, I was meaning laser-based missile defenses to replace interception missiles on the closing missiles. That's probably ten years away in terms of actually being mass produced in peacetime but in wartime if a war came along they could be probably produced quite quickly because uh there's a lot of tech already development if the people had the uh, if the people had the need to put it into service right it's half past so i'm finishing now but i'm going to finish off the questions down to martin doherty's one um Harrison. Hmm.
Right then. Take care, Richard Hughes. Carl Gasman, missile defense. Don't be seen, don't be targeted. Or take out launchers before they can fire you. Uh, Jerison. Trent Delenko, have you heard of anything in regards to Chinese over the horizon backscatter radars in terms of ability to track ships? There's lots of efforts in them, but whether they're working or not is a different matter. They're going to try and work on it, but you know. Um, take care, Jay. Take care, Trent. I'll see ham operators are frying fits over the transmissions, stomping on their frequencies. Oh, well, that's going to probably cause trouble for those radars as well, let's be honest. If you've got ham radio, uh, radio operators operating on those frequencies, that's going to create a lot of false returns. Don't you? This is the whole reason. You don't want to use the same frequencies for radar as people to use for communication. It can cause all sorts of random returns. Jeff Bieler, see you Saturday. Take care, Stephanie. Yeah. Take care, Martin. See you Sunday. Paul Johnson. Dirty. Maybe 57 before. Mm, that probably will be used as well. Take care, Angus. Take care, Vision. Take care, Albert. Take care, Richard. Take care, SMP. Enjoy Golden Eagle. It's all about China's, the most recent one. Um, Tis France Full. Take care. Paul Johnson. Hello. Ben Grogan. Thank you. Take care. Martin. Take care. Eric. Thank you. Take care. Carl Gasman. Uh, over the horizon with Russian, even Australians have land based ones of several thousand mile range. And that they do. Take care, Jay Richardson. Take care, Golden Eagle. Take care, John Shay. Night night. Carl Gosman, my pleasure. King's Rook, take care. John Emmett, take care in Texas. Let's try and avoid the heat. Um, Osprey 28. Well, take care. <laughs> oh. That's Thompson. That's luck. Still alive. Take care, Stafford. Good luck. Paul Johnson, take care. Blue Shirt Butter, it's a pleasure. Steve White, take care. Ken McGuire. Well, more than a few of us hams did try the jam, the old Russian woodpecker over the horizon radar back in the day. Yeah, they do. Right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Hang on. Bye. Thank you. Thank you to all my subscribers. Please do share and like and. Take care. Have a nice evening. And thank you to all my watchers as well. Take care, Nighthound Productions. Turning 3434. Uh, bye, Doctor. Don't wake me up tonight, please. I might do. I might do. It's fun. It's fun to wake people up sometimes. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone.